Now, I, I mentioned that I would talk about nitrogen a moment ago. This, this is a picture of, of Anne's hand uh, holding a, um, um, a, a plant with the roots, uh, where there's little nodules that you see on it. Those little nodules are nodules that contain nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Uh, and you've probably heard about, about um, this, this phenomenon. Um, it's an example of a symbiosis in which the plant essentially creates an environment in which those microbes live, where they essentially get nutrition and they, they essentially, in turn, crank out nitrogen for the plants. Why is that important? Well, because nitrogen is one of the limiting elements for plant growth. And yet we're bathed in nitrogen, what, 78 or so percent of the atmosphere that we're breathing right now is made out of nitrogen, but it's a very stable molecule. The N2 molecule, it takes a lot of energy to crack uh, into nitrogen that can be biologically useful. Microbes, who have an incredible genetic repertoire and diversity, as we'll talk a bit more about later, um, have th certain microbes have the ability to crack atmospheric nitrogen and bring it into the biological world. Uh, and plants and microbes have formed symbiotic partnerships in which some populations of those microbes live intimately related with plant roots, and they essentially trade sugar for nitrogen. What is it that plants can actually do that nothing else really can? Well, except that some, some bacteria now, um, they can photosynthesize, they have carbon factories. They essentially can print money for the underground economy. And they trade it to microbes for things that they need, like nitrogen or phosphorus. There's a zone around the roots of plants called the rhizosphere that you may know about, you may have heard about, may be new to you, but it's full of microbes, uh, microbial life, uh, bacteria and fungi. And I was really surprised in doing the research for this book to, to learn that plants actually leak a substantial amount of the carbon or the carbohydrates, the, the sugary compounds that they generate through photosynthesis. They leak a surprising amount of that out through their roots into the soil. Why would they do that? You know, why would a farmer essentially take a, you know, a quarter to a third of their crop and go put it out by the highway for anybody to take? It just makes no sense. Unless you're essentially using, someone said compost, I think, if I'm hearing right. And that's on the right track. I mean, they're basically, what they're doing is they're basically exuding, because we call these compounds exudates, because they exude out of the roots. They're feeding the microbes in the rhizosphere. They're basically trying to attract populations of beneficial microbes. They wouldn't do this if it was bad for them. Or at least, you know, they would be selected, there'd be strong negative selection pressures in an evolutionary sense if they were feeding the pathogens. So they're basically leaking out exudates, exudates to create a living halo of beneficial microorganisms around their root system. Um, this is something, you know, I wasn't taught in college. It was sort of a, this is, I think this is the kind of discovery over the last couple decades that is really changing the way we see and think about microbial life. In many ways, they're essentially the secret silent partners of the plant world and, as we'll see, in terms of the animal world as well. So the rhizosphere is a zone that's rich with microbial life. It's got many times the density of, li of microbial life than the area, than soil outside of the rhizosphere. And it forms this living halo around plants. And what happens in there? Well, you can kind of think about it, if you want, as a biological bazaar. It's a place where there's all kinds of exchanges happening, uh, where plants are trading nutrients in exchange for microbial metabolites, where they trade exudates for microbial waste products. It's a kind of, it really is sort of a win-win a situation where the things that plants need, microbes can provide as their waste products, and plants who have these sugar factories on board in terms of chloroplasts in their leaves, which, by the way, used to be independent free-living microbes, as we'll get back to, um, that produce sugar for them. They trade that in exchange for what the microbes can produce. Um, so fungal hyphae over there, shown in the upper left, uh, are actually very good at scavenging nutrients out of the soil. And I mentioned phosphorus. There's certain um, um, mycorrhizae that are very good at going out and just bringing phosphorus back and trading it to plants. Um, Microbial metabolites uh, can serve uh, uh, major roles in, uh, in plant health, um, including, surprisingly, um, keying in and changing plant response, plant defense systems. If you think about, well, I didn't imagine before I was starting to work on this book that, you, that when above ground pests attack plants, those plants can release chemical signals in their exudates into the soil that essentially trigger microbes in the soil to in turn generate metabolites that the plant uses to help defend itself against those predators. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's not what I was taught in my soil science class. <laughs> um, so you have this communication going on between the plants and the, and the microbes that they are subsidizing with their sugary exudates. There's this back and forth signaling and communication. If you think about what kind of an immune system, a defense system, does a plant have? And I know I shouldn't use the immune system for a plant, but I did that on purpose. What kind of a defense system does a plant have? They're stuck in place. They don't move around. They, can actually, they basically take advantage of the wider genetic repertoire of soil life to essentially trade compounds they can make for compounds that come in handy for them as long as they keep those beneficial microbes around and living in the rhizosphere. This is an example of a symbiosis, um, of a win-win situation where two different species, co in effect, cooperate, each pursuing their own interest, but generating a, a more beneficial um, system. You might think about that in the way that, like, um, you know, villages uh, are symbioses between people, um, where we can specialize in doing different things. I can be a geologist, you can do whatever you do, um, and together we build a bigger society. This is a kind of, those kind of uh, interchanges uh, and processes happen in between plants and microbes as well. You can also look at what happens if you take away the need for plants to generate their exudates. If you look at different, um, Differences in fertilization, for example, it can affect the style and material with which you fertilize plants can affect root growth and thereby affect the production of plant exudates, um, which influences in turn the, the microbial life in the rhizosphere and the density of microbial life in the rhizosphere. Um, and so if you look in that uh, figure that we're showing here, um, if you look in the, on the left-hand side, it's sort of an abstract plant root uh, under uh, no, these are uh, roots taken from um, uh, tomato plants, if I recall correctly, um, that show the example of the root system that develops with, with no fertilizer. In the middle, it's conventional nitrogen-rich fertilizer, um, and you'll notice that you don't get quite the root density. Well, if, if a plant doesn't have to work very hard to actually acquire the nutrients that it needs, the nitrogen that it needs for growth, it puts less energy into root growth, and it exudes less of those microbe-supporting compounds into the soil. You get a relatively depauperate rhizosphere or just or a less diverse rhizosphere in those situations. Over on the right, if you're using composted manure, well, it stimulates microbial growth. You get a much richer rhizosphere, you know, much, um, a much denser root network and a richer rhizosphere. In other words, the nature of what plants eat, if we can talk about plants eating, which I will do, so I might as well talk, I will talk more about that, so I will talk about that. Um, if we can think about what plants eat, what they actually have in terms of their nutrient sources actually matters to their growth, their health, and their relationship with their microbes, which is where the relationship with people and our microbes will come back in in a little bit. So if we look at the rhizosphere in plants, um, they're really rich in microalgae, little fungi that serve as an extension to the roots of the plant. You can think of the fungi as essentially uh, hair extensions for, for plant roots, if you will. They can actually reach, except ones that can actually reach out and bring things back to you. So science fiction hair extensions. Um, and what they'll do is they, the, those mycorrhizal fungi will forage for nutrients that they then can um, scavenge, bring back into the rhizosphere, and release and trade with plants uh, for, you guessed it, exudates. Um, what does that do for plants? Well, it really can enhance their uh, uptake of minerals, things that we need as micronutrients, things we want in crops, um, and they can enhance the, the uptake of basic nutrients and micronutrients as well. So essentially, they, and they also can provide for the, the chemical signaling and exchanges that influence plant growth. Some of the microbial, um, the microbial um, metabolites that are generated from either exudates or from the processing of organic matter, the other source of nourishment and nutrients to, to microbes, can actually boost plant growth. They, they can, some of these microbes are producing plant growth promoting hormones that plants need. You know, that, plant, that microbes are producing hormones to promote plant growth, that's not taught in Basic Fertilizer 101. The other thing that really surprised me as a geologist though, is that when I looked back at the order in which life came back to our yard, it looked kind of familiar to me. It's kind of the same order in which life evolved on Earth. That's, that graph over there on the left-hand side shows you essentially 
the order in which life evolved on Earth. So on the terrestrial part of Earth, we're leaving the, I know the oceans cover most of the world and oceanographers will object to this, but I'm gonna leave the oceans aside. We can call that the cradle of life. When life came onto land, um, what order did it happen in? Well, bacteria and fungi arrived first. The microbes arrived first, started colonizing it. They um, worked on the surface. Uh, algal and bacterial mats uh, are recorded in sort of the first fossil soils from about 480 some odd million years ago back in the, the Ordovician period. Land plants arrived next in the, Sil in the Silurian. And arthropods, things that broke down um, land plants. The first insect detritivores, the first non soil dwelling, uh, well the first insect detritivores arrived in the Devonian about 420 million years ago at a time when giant mushrooms dominated the landscape. Mushrooms that got to be like 20 feet tall were, were huge, uh, the, the kind of the you know, land of the lost kind of, kind of uh, science fiction view stuff. Uh, there was a time when that was there. Uh, in the Carboniferous you get the first insect herbivores, the first insects above ground that actually started eating plants. Um, you get ferns and seed bearing plants. You then got uh, reptiles and conifers. Um, the first dinosaurs, well, we didn't have any dinosaurs come back in our yard, I'll admit that. I was kind of disappointed, but um, well, maybe upon reflection, I'm pretty happy that none came. Um, but then mammals and birds, and then finally us. I mean, you look at that list, and that same order is a basically the order in which life came back in our yard as we watched it come in over the course of about a decade, culminating in that, that drunk that I probably shouldn't have mentioned. Um, but the, the, the take home message that we took from this was essentially that it was kickstarting the microbial life below ground that reset the foundation for all that followed. That the foundation for terrestrial life is actually in the hidden half of nature in the part of life below ground. And the thing that we'll sort of follow up on this with in terms of looking at the importance of this for human health is that if you think about the partners that all the different steps in the evolutionary history of life would have had along the way, microbes were there. We've never been sanitized. Our ancestors were never clean or free of microbes. There were partnerships that were forged in the fires of deep time, in the evolutionary fires of long periods of time that actually shaped the development of things like the human immune system like the plant defense system, the things that keep plants and people healthy, actually have been tuned over incredibly long periods of time through the interaction with the microbial world, with the hidden half of nature. Now, the whole history of life, as we're starting to learn, is sort of wrapped up in relationships with microbial life, but we didn't even know that microbes existed until the 17th century. Uh, and Antony von Leeuwenhoek, this gentleman uh, here shown in his resplendent robe, uh, was the guy who discovered microbes. He was a Dutch draper. Uh, he, he got really interested in, in microscopes because he wanted to be able to examine the fibers that made up the linens that he sold. And his hobby turned into creating microscopes. Uh, so he invented sort of the, the best microscopes of his day. And Lo and behold, in a um, sample of pond water that he had uh, sampled, he discovered th these you know, small things swimming around in a forest of, of small plants. He considered microbes marvelous curiosities. He called them wee beasties. Uh, he thought maybe they did some things, but that they, wasn't, they weren't really thought to be all that important for one simple reason. They were really small. I mean, you couldn't see them. We didn't even know that they were there. How could something that was invisible, so tiny, actually do anything important at all. It just did not make sense in his day. Um, and it took several centuries after Leon Hook's astounding discoveries for scientists to start really thinking that microbes did anything of much interest. It wasn't until the 19th century that uh, people started to realize, oh, it's microbes that actually fermented beer and wine. Maybe they were useful after all. <laughs> um, or that they actually were the root of some diseases. Maybe they weren't so good after all. Um, and in 2015, Brian Ford built some replicas of Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. There's a photograph of, of one of his that shows you uh, the kind of things that Leeuwenhoek would have seen down there at the bottom. But the point there is that it took a long time after we recognized that microbes actually existed to come to the conclusion that they did much of any importance. If we fast forward to today, we actually know that if we look at the kind of sort of modern tree of life, uh, that has resulted from genetic sequencing, it shows that microbes are actually sort of dominate the tree of life. Um, 
This shows Carl Woese's famous figure from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from 1990, where you can see the sort of the branching structure, um, as he put it, of the tree of life, where bacteria over there in blue, uh, archaea, which are also single-celled things that would look just like bacteria to you and I, but have a different composition and structure. Um, are two of the three main branches of, of life. The eukarya over there, the sort of the, the animals that have uh, nuclei and that uh, well, all sort of multicellular life arose from, is over there on that side. Everything, every branch in that tree that has an M, a star, or a C, everything that's just a letter, those are microbes. Notice that plants, fungi, and animals, the three the parts of nature that we tend to know of as nature, are just three little branches over on the right-hand side. And people would be this tiny little twig over on the corner of the animals. Um, so the world of life as we know it is dominated by microbial life. They are, they are incredibly diverse genetically. Their ability to do things in terms of their, their um, genetic repertoire, their ability to make, to make things, to change things, to transform things, to break things down, turn them into useful things, is actually quite astounding. Um, and it turns out that uh, the complex life that we know, the complex life that we are, actually came from the mergers, early mergers, of microbial life. This is something that Lynn Margulis um, really um, brought back to the scientific forefront in the 1960s in a paper that she wrote um, in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, where she basically argued a view that I think has been mostly borne out, um, that the evolution of sort of the animals, fungi, and plants, the nature we know down there at the bottom of this, of this graph, um, is rooted in the mergers of, back, of microbial life back in deep time. That the first merger was between an archaean and a bacteria, two single cell forms of life that came together a couple million years ago to form the first um, ancestor of what would then become the ancestor of animals and fungi, uh, well, and plants. Uh, and in that second merger, Another bacteria, an oxygen-breathing bacteria, was added, it was essentially engulfed by an early, that first merger, and incorporated, without killing it, it sort of became part of this new, um, this new organism. Um, and that second merger basically delivered what we know of as mitochondria to the, to the, dean, to, to, to the scheme. Those are the powerhouses that run all your cells. The third merger shown there, about some 900 million years ago, added um, a photosynthetic bacteria, um, the ancestor of what is now the chloroplast, the thing that actually fixes carbon for plants. Um, and so you can see the evolution of the nature that we know actually came through various mergers to create symbiotic partnerships between once free-living bacteria that teamed up to create the more complex world of life.